Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm a bit of an accidental data scientist. Um, my day job is a, an AI, artificial intelligence researcher, but I've been interested in running and marathon running for a few years, and, and that sort of hobby has overlapped with some of the professional interests I have. Do we have any runners in the room? One. Any marathons? Yeah, Dublin? Or Dingle. Oh, nice one. Yeah. Dublin. Oh, great. Okay. All right. So, um, Dublin's a great marathon, a really great marathon. So I was, I was kind of curious because uh, marathon running has it's become very popular running in general uh, over the last few years. And, and of course, uh, once you get into it, you really get into it. Um, one of the jokes is, uh, how do you know if someone's a marathon runner? Don't worry, they'll tell you. I should just, once you get, that's all you talk about, you know? Um, and then over the last few years, it's become particularly interesting from a data perspective because as we go about our exercise, we're generating so much data. Almost everything we do in the world today is generating data that ends up being stored somewhere. And if you go out for a wander around your local park, you'll see people running and they all have phones strapped to their arms and other things strapped to their waist and chest and wrists. So they're just collecting their data, uh, presumably with a view to doing something with that data, although the, the dirty secret is that we rarely look at anything beyond how many steps we've taken a day. So that's, a, that's another issue. Um, it's been an interesting year for marathon running as well because a number of organizations, Nike in particular, um, declared that they were going to try and break the fabled two hour mark. They didn't quite make it. It was a very controlled setting. Uh, I think they got two hours and 23, four or five seconds was the final time. It's all up on YouTube, well worth the watch. Um, by the way, if, you're, if you want to run a two-hour marathon, um, you basically, I, I would have to sprint flat out for two hours to make a two-hour marathon. That's how fast these people are going. Well, and, and you see elite marathon runners, and they look like they're kind of not really breaking a sweat. They're just sort of gliding along. Um, just be aware that they are, for us mortals, they're sprinting. Right. Um, so anyway, let me talk a little bit about the marathon data set that I've assembled and, and some of the insights that I've gleaned from that. So first of all, most marathons uh, present the results data to the public. You know, it's just it's public data. They give you the information about the participants, uh, their club, their bib number, their age category, their finish times. And a lot of these marathons also make available <coughs> data sets of split times. So in this case, we were interested in 5K splits. So a marathon is 42.195 kilometers. That 0.195 is really important. Um, but they usually uh, provide the information in 5K splits, which means every five kilometers, the runners run over a timing mat and it notes their time at those five kilometer segments. So it means for a particular race, you have about nine different measures um, from start to finish, nine different timings. And we were able to collect this data um, at scale because we can write scripts. So I wrote some, some Python code, which would go into these marathon websites and pull down the data. Um, and over time then, I was able to collect about two and a half million race records. Uh, for over a hundred different races across 20 cities um, over sort of 12 year period, roughly speaking. So for some cities you have it for fewer years, maybe two or three years. For other cities like Chicago and Boston and New York, you have long, longer term data. Um, you don't always get precise age information. Sometimes you get five year age categories, for example. Uh, you'll typically get information about uh, male, female runners, their country of origin, uh, club information if they're in running clubs, etc. Um, you're able to guesstimate repeat marathons. So you've typically got the runner's name, but that's not good enough to find the same runner across multiple races because lots of people have the same names. But you can do it with a combination of name and sex and year of birth and perhaps typical finish time. So John Smith, who runs a four-hour marathon, is probably not the same John Smith who runs a six-hour marathon or a two-and-a-half-hour marathon. So you can make some estimates there. So let me just hit you with some of the, the things that we discovered here. So 
But really, why was I doing this? Well, I'm just interested in data, and it kind of fascinates me that you can get lots and lots of information on, on, about people's activities and start to learn some general patterns that seem to occur in those activities. If you're a marathon runner, there's all this conventional wisdom that lines up behind years and years of running. And you'll, you'll as you come to race day, you'll start to, um, in marathon, you kind of train for 16 weeks. Then you go into this horrible period called your taper. Do you remember that? So you're basically told no more training for about three weeks before the race, or at least you have to ease off. Um, and that's the, the phrase taper tantrums comes from this idea that we kind of go a bit stir crazy. So as a distraction, you start to read as much as you can about the advice, which just freaks you out even more. But this advice tells you good, sensible things like don't start too fast, start, start slower uh, than you think, um, you know, try and keep an even pace throughout, all of these sorts of things. Uh, and the question is, is all this conventional wisdom supported by the data? And what other things can we find from the data? So a couple of things that, that I thought were, were interesting. Um, one of them was, uh, it's well known that men are faster runners than women, and there's some reasonable physiological reasons why that should be the case. So typically, men will run about 10 to 12 percent faster than women. They have, tend to have a greater muscle mass and different VO2 max capabilities. But one of the interesting things we found is that women tend to be much more disciplined runners. Now, I don't think this is surprising at all. You know, the typical male blasts off the line as fast as they can and destroys themselves later in the race. So their pace varies a lot. So what we're looking at here is pace variation. So this, think about this as just how much are their running speeds changing during the course of the race? And how does that vary with finish time? So the really fast elite runners have very little pace variation. They're running a very even race. For slower and slower runners, so three hour runners, four hour runners, five hour runners, pace variation starts to increase. And this is, this is the male pace variation, this is female pace variation. And you can see really clearly that men have much more varied pace than women. So women are able to run a much more disciplined, controlled marathon, which arguably is a, a better marathon by, by a number of measures. Um, you also find that um, um, oh, oh, younger runners, so for example, younger males, the solid line here, tend to be have more pace variation than older males. And again, that's the sort of the classic uh, caricature of the, the young, impertinent guy who dashes off the line. So that was one interesting thing. Another interesting thing we found is that pacing groups matter. So it's good to run with a pacing group, and lots of people tend to hit their paced finish times when they run with a pacing group. So this is one of the things that's often asked in a race. Should I, should I run with a pacing group? And look at the spikes here. These are the, these are the finish times associated with pacing groups in the Dublin Marathon 2013 to 15. There were slightly different pacers in other marathons, but you can see a big spike in the number of finishers. So people are following these pacing groups. And when you look at the pacing, variation amongst those runners that finish at those pace times. It's much lower than the pace variations of people who run at intermediate times. So there's good evidence there that pacing groups are helping you to, to run a better marathon. Another interesting one was hitting the wall. This is the idea that um, around about the 20 mile mark, 30 kilometer mark, people will essentially run out of steam and they're, they sort of collapse and they're, they uh, start to walk and things get very nasty. Um, if they haven't trained enough or paced themselves properly. Again, just as we found that women were much more disciplined, even runners, we found that men tend to hit, tend to hit the wall much more frequently than women. And for this, we were, we were defining the wall as a 30% pace decline in the second half of the race relative to the first half of the race. And you can see here, slower as for faster runners, they, they rarely hit the wall. They're just, they know what they're doing. But for us mere mortals, finishing around the four hour mark, about th one in three people, one in three men hit the wall, but only about one in 10 women hit the wall. So big, big difference in the frequency with which people hit the wall based on whether they're men or women. Um, Finally, another interesting one that we've taken a bit further, and this is, um, will be 
published in the Journal of Sports Analytics this year, was fast starts and, and slow finishes. So the wisdom was, don't go out too fast or you'll finish slower. And is that borne out? And we looked at a relative uh, pacing here. So roughly speaking, you've got an average pace for the race. And then we can look at your pace in each of the, the segments of the race, in particular the start segment, the first 5K. And we can ask, did you run faster or slower than your average pace for the race overall? And we see here that the majority of people run faster than their, their average race pace. So their average race pace is zero. Here we're running 5% faster, 10% faster, 15% faster. Lots of people running faster, relatively few people running slower at the start of the race relative to the race overall. What happens to those people who run faster or slower? Well, we find that their average finish time increases the faster they start. So people who start at their average race pace finish on average just under four hours. People who start at 10% faster finish on average about four and a half hours. So there's a, there's a 30 minute, over 30 minute difference between people who finish or who start at their race pace and those who start a little faster. Similar difference for people who start too slowly as well. The faster you start, the slower you finish essentially. And the slower you start, the, the slower you finish as well. So you're best off starting at or near your average race pace. And you know, that's correlation, not necessarily causation, but we found the same effect when we stratified runners for different finish times. When we looked at people who, who achieved a personal best, we found that most people achieved a personal best over their marathon history when they started at or near their average race pace. Those that started too fast rarely achieved a personal best. Those that started a bit slower often did, um, but not as many as those that started on their personal, on their average race pace. We found similar effects for people who finished faster and slower as well. Actually, people who finished faster tended not to produce better overall marathon times. It was as if they finished faster because they had still too much left in the tank and they hadn't spent it all over the course of their race. So they finished with, with uh, still something to give. I won't go into that in too much more detail. So, so that's a sort of rough summary. It's been an interesting few years collecting this data. Um, we now have one of the world's largest marathon data sets. Uh, and it, it really opens up a whole new opportunity to analyze uh, this type of data and to figure out, you know, start to line it up with what's this, what the sports science tells us. So, so we're now starting to work with physiotherapists and sports scientists in the Insight Center for Data Analytics looking at this. Um, and we're, we've a number of new research projects that have, that have emerged as a result of this. It also gave me an opportunity to experiment with some data science blogging. And I started to write up a lot of this as I went on a blog called Running With Data, um, which was picked up then uh, both nationally and internationally. Um, and it's been really interesting bringing some of these data insights into the, the world of running. Thank you.